Aren't you grateful for the faithfulness of God? My goodness, it is so good. Let, let me just say this. In a world that is not faithful, that is not dependable, that, that you can't trust, it is great that we serve a God that has been faithful from generation to generation. Man, that we can lean into that. That's good. That is good. Um, on October the 31st, 1517, a little-known German monk who was fed up with the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church, penned 95 issues that needed to be fixed in the church. And this lit like a firestorm all across Christendom until in 1521, this monk, Martin Luther, was asked to make a defense for his beliefs and to describe why it wasn't heresy. Now, when, when, when Martin Luther was called before what was called the Diet of Worms, Martin Luther had knew that he was facing certain death, like death by being burned at the stake. And Martin Luther goes in, man against the Catholic Church, and this is what he said. He said, unless I'm convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. And as Luther departed, history tells us that a large group of Spaniards followed him, yelling, burn him, burn him. Then, just 10 years later, as the Reformation set all of Europe, not Martin Luther, on fire, <laughs> our Baptist forefathers, the Anabaptists, rediscovered the doctrinal conviction of baptism by immersion. They, they recovered this belief that, that we're baptized not because baptism in some way saves us, but instead we are baptized because of the command of Christ, and we follow Jesus in believer's baptism after we place our faith in him. Now, this is hard to believe in the 21st century, but actually at this time, many people gave up their lives for this one belief. Men, women, and children died just for the belief in believer's baptism. One such man was Michael Sattler. Sattler was arrested and given the opportunity to recant his belief in baptism. Again, not recant Jesus, just baptism. However, Sattler was unwilling to let go of his conviction because he believed that's what God's word said. He was tortured in ways that I don't feel comfortable describing up here. But on his way to be killed, five separate times he had flesh removed from his body by red hot tongs. Then, whenever he arrived at the location that he would be martyred, they tied him to a ladder and he was given the opportunity to pray one last prayer, and Sattler prayed this. He said, Almighty, eternal God, thou art the way and the truth. And because I have not been shown to be in error, I will, with thy help on this day, testify to the truth and seal it with my blood. And after saying that, Sattler was pushed into the flames of a raging fire and burned to death. These are just two stories of saints that faced chaos way more extreme than the chaos that most of us face today. Yet they, they stood steadfast in tumultuous circumstances. When it seemed like the entire world was against them, they confidently stood and chaos. What I want to ask today is, how did they do that? How did they do that? 
Because I want that. I want that kind of faith. I want to be like what Paul exhorted the church in Corinth to be, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So here's the question I want to answer today. How, how do we have peace in chaos? How do we have peace in chaos? And to answer that question, I want to open our Bibles to Psalm 121. So if you have your Bibles with you today, and I hope that you do, uh, I, I would ask that you would open your Bible with me to Psalm 121. In Psalm 121, we have the psalmist writing introspectively about help in times of trouble. What, what to do when you face a difficult time or a difficult season. And that, that's where we're at in Psalm 121. We're going to start in verse 1. If you don't have your Bibles with you today, that's okay. You can follow with us on the screens. This is what the psalmist writes. He says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The psalmist begins by painting this picture of lifting his eyes to the hills and asking where his help comes from. Now, this is kind of difficult to relate with on the Texas Gulf Coast, right? I, I was just yesterday in the Texas Hill Country. You want to know why it's called the Texas Hill Country? Because there's hills. Here, our greatest hill is the Fred Hartman Bridge, right? There are no hills here. We, we don't have anything to look up to to get help. But I, I want to remind you that, that the psalmist is not writing from our geography, Instead, he is writing from a geography similar to, not the same as, but similar to the Texas Hill Country. And, and, and he's saying, I lift up my eyes to the hills. He's, he's, he's setting his glance upward. Now, the different Bible scholars think that this could be related to do uh, several different things. Maybe, maybe one of the pictures that the psalmist is, is kind of painting for us today is the picture of an army that is surrounded by a larger army on every side, and their only hope and their only help are reinforcements coming over the hills. An another, another maybe uh, mental picture is just imagining hoping for help coming from the hills. Not, not necessarily, if you, if you pay attention to verses 1 and 2, the psalmist isn't, though, looking for reinf reinforcements that are physical. Rather, he's looking for reinforcements that are from his God. So I was thinking about this this last week. It reminds me of a story in the Old Testament you may or may not be familiar with in 2 Kings chapter 6. Second Kings, in 2 Kings 6, there's a prophet of God named Elisha, S-H, right? There's Elijah with the J, and then there's Elisha with the S-H, right? Elisha, it finds himself serving Israel, and at the time, God's people are under attack from the king of Syria. And so the king of Syria keeps trying to attack God's people, and, and there are several different times that the king of Syria gets word of exactly where the king of Israel is, and he gets his forces together, and he sends his forces to attack where the king is. However, unknown to the king of Syria, every time he thinks he's got the upper hand, God appears to Elisha and tells him that the king of Syria is coming, and Elisha gets word to the king of Israel, and he's able to escape. It happens like two or three different times. Finally, the king of Syria is ticked off. He's like, guys, I know there's a rat somewhere. <laughs> We need to smoke them out. Who's telling them that we're coming? Where are they getting it from? And one of his advisors has heard of the prophet Elisha and believes what is happening. And he says, no, 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 king. You're going after the wrong guy. You see, if, if you want to win, you got to kill the prophet. 
The prophet is the one that's actually winning this for the other side. And so the king hears where Elisha is, and he sends his entire army to surround the town where Elisha is found. But what's surprising is Elisha isn't bothered by being surrounded on all sides. Read this with me in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. It says, when the servant, being the servant of Elisha, of the man of God, rose early in the morning, he went out, and behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, I don't don't know about you, but I relate a lot with the servant in this story, right? All too often, my physical eyes outperform my spiritual eyes, impressively. (laughs) All too often, what I see scares me, and I forget to look with the spiritual insight that God has given me. When I'm surrounded, when I'm overwhelmed, when it feels like I'm in the middle of chaos, I oftentimes get overwhelmed by the physical things, and I want physical solutions to what seem to be physical issues that I'm facing, right? It's easier to trust a sword in your hand than it is to trust a prayer in your heart. It's easier to have faith in your bank account than it is to believe in the promises of God. It's easier to find comfort when your insurance premium is paid rather than finding comfort in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And please hear me, I'm not against any of those things except uh, I probably wouldn't advise you to carry a sword on your hip, right? Um, But I'm not against any of those things. I just want to ask you to evaluate today this question. Where does my help come from? For you, where does your help come from? Where is your ultimate help found? What's the source? The psalmist is clear here. He says, my help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. I think maybe for most of us in this room, we need to memorize these 11 words. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. When the the bills are bigger than your checking account, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heavens and the earth. Whenever the diagnosis is discouraging, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. When you're sideways relationally and it doesn't seem like you're going to make any headway in that relationship, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. See it, Christian, you will not find the solution and you won't find the solution because biblically you weren't made to find the solution on earth. You were made to seek your father in heaven and to rely on him in faith to provide the solution for the problems that you face. The psalmist says, I lift my eyes to the hills. He says that his help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And he goes on to describe his help. He says this in verse 3. He says, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon 
by night. The text says that God will not let your foot slip. How great news is that? For those of you that follow Jesus today, it's great news to know that if you are seeking Jesus with all of your heart, you cannot slip out of his will. It's only when you stray from walking with Jesus that your foot slips. If you're following Jesus, your foot will not slip. But it also says that he who keeps us will not slumber. In verse 4, it says that he who watches over us will neither slumber nor sleep. Have you ever thought about this? God doesn't need to sleep. Let me tell you, as a parent with young children, that's unfathomable for me. Because I need to sleep all the time. There's never a time in my life where I'm like, oh, you know what, I don't need to sleep right now. I, like, if, if, if y'all would just be quiet and let me lay down on the stage for a second, I could be asleep quickly. But God never slept, (laughs) never has no need to sleep. In fact, even his institution of the Sabbath, right? God created everything in six days and institutes the Sabbath on day seven. That wasn't because he needed a break. It was because he was trying to teach you and I, our go-getter Americans, I'm going to get it done. He's trying to teach us rest. He's trying to teach us the importance of rest. I remember... um, Many years ago, actually before my wife and I went overseas, uh, I, I got the pleasure of taking several of you on a mission trip to Kenya, and it was awesome. We, we got to do uh, all kinds of different work with, with orphans and in a school, and uh, we got to do lots of different things. It was, it, was, it was incredible. And at the very end of the trip, we had planned a safari. It was really cool. We went to this game reserve, and we spent one night and we were there two days. And where we, where we stayed was inside the game reserve, right? So like day one, we pull up, we get in the Jeeps. I mean, everything you imagine, right? Like National Geographic stuff, you know what I'm talking about? Like everything you can picture, that, that's what we got to do. And we, we go and we're, we're driving out and we got to see so many animals. It was, it was like, it was also a time where like there was a migration happening. So we saw enough wildebeest to scare Mufasa. You know what I'm talking about? Like it was a lot. We, we, saw, we saw all the different animals, and, and I know that you've seen a lion at the zoo, but let me just tell you, when you see a lion in the wild and you hear a male lion growl, it hits different. Like, I, I remember the guide that we had in the front, he's like, hey, you know, you can, you can get out the top and kind of look at it. I'm like, no, I'm good, man. Let, let's, let's keep the windows closed. Like, I'm, I'm happy right here. This is where I need to be. And, and so, so we do all that all day. Then we come back and we eat at night, and I realize for the very first time, we're staying in the game reserve in like glorified tents. And I saw the lions. <laughs> like I, I saw their teeth, I saw their claws, and I'm like, what's keeping a lion out of my tent tonight? You know, and, and so, so we were chatting about it, and and we got to meet, basically, this uh, the organization, whatever, that puts this thing on, hires Maasai warriors to guard where we were staying. And every single one of these warriors, their job was to not sleep. All of the warriors, supposedly, I still have a hard time believing this, but supposedly, all of the warriors had killed a full-grown lion with a spear. Now, again, I know that you've seen a lion at the zoo, but I'm telling you, man, when you see a lion, you're like, there's no, what? But these Maasai warriors, their only job was to guard the camp. And can I tell you something? When I found that out, that night, I went in my tent, and I put down the mosquito net, and this dude slept well. You know why? Why? Because I had a guardian that wasn't falling asleep, that was going to protect me all night long. Christian, do you want to know how you can go to sleep this Tuesday night and sleep like a baby even though the election results haven't come in yet? You can do that by believing that he who watches over you is mightier than whoever will be elected. He's stronger. The Almighty God watches over us. 
There's a great peace that comes from knowing that our God is with us. Then in verse 5, it says, not only that, it says that our God is the shade of our right hand, that the sun will not smite us by day. That's what the King James says. Man, if there was ever a relatable verse in the Bible for Texans, it's this one. All right, we all know what it's like to be in the July or August heat, and then you're, you, you see shade. Or how many of you have been mowing your yard, and you know that one section that's shaded by the trees? And you're just like, Let the, I'm just going to mow this section over and over and over again, right? Why? Because that section has shade. And, and what, what's, what's kind of intriguing about shade is shade does not eliminate the sun, Shade does not take away from the pain of the sun. It doesn't do any of those things. Rather, it gives you the ability to stand under the sun. And I, what I want to tell you today, Christian, is sometimes, there are times, Christians, when God's answer to your prayer is not taking you out of the circumstances you face, but rather giving you the grace, the shade, to endure the circumstance that you find yourself in. Sometimes God is not going to remove you. Sometimes God is going to enable you to stand up under what you're facing. Three times, the scripture says that, that God is the keeper. He's our keeper. He's the one that keeps our soul. What's, what's, what's amazing about thinking about that is, is I feel like there, there are several different ways that God is our keeper. The first, if you grew up in church, you're familiar with this, right? God is our keeper and that God initiates salvation, right? It is by grace we are saved through faith, a gift of God, not of works, so that none of us can boast. So we are able to call out to Jesus, to place our faith in Jesus, and not because of what we've done, but because of the goodness of God exp expressed to us in Christ, you can be saved from your sin all of your sin. This, this might be new to you, but when Jesus died on the cross, the blood that Jesus spilled, when Jesus died, Jesus didn't just die to be like this really beautiful literary figure in, in, in a book. No, Jesus died because Jesus was taking God's wrath that you deserved and that I deserved. When Jesus' blood was spilt, it was spilt for every sin that you have committed, every sin that you are committing right now, and every sin that you will commit the rest of your life. Think of it. The sins that you don't even know about 10 years from now, Jesus paid for on a cross 2,000 years ago. That's one way that God keeps us. But that's not the only way that God keeps us. You see, after we are saved, God also graciously justifies us and adopts us. What that means is God no longer sees you as a sinner. It's not just that you're a sinner covered by grace. God now sees you as a son or a daughter. And in the same way, parents in the room, in the same way that you sustain your children's lives, in the same way that you would do whatever it took to keep your kids from going hungry, hear this, your heavenly Father keeps you. And your heavenly Father will continue to keep you. And again, the great hope, the joy, is that that's not all. God is also keeping us by continually sanctifying us. He's making us more and more and more like him. So you can have confidence, Christian, that you cannot lose your salvation because you cannot out the grace of God. Confidence oozes out of the Christian when we begin to grasp that we are saved by grace and not by what we do. It's all God's grace. Read, read these two verses here in verse 7 and 8. It says, The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Again, we have God as the one that's keeping us. 
Except this time, if, if you are an English major, you'll notice the verb tense has changed. It's futuristic. He will keep you. He will keep you. You know, this last week was Halloween. I don't know about you, but my kids love Halloween. This year, my kids had two costumes, and and they got to wear different costumes on different days. My youngest son, Jet, was an army man. And let me tell you, he didn't take his costume off, I think, for three days straight. Like, slept in it, woke up, lived in it, everything in it. He, he wasn't pretending to be an army man. Let me tell you, he was an army man for three days. About a month ago, we went to uh, Lowe's, though, because I had to grab a couple things. I don't know if you've ever been to Lowe's around Halloween time, but Lowe's does this really stupid thing where when you walk in the store, right at the very front as you walk in, there are some of the scariest Halloween decorations that exist on planet Earth. I mean, just terrifying stuff. So, I go to Lowe's with all three of my older children, not thinking anything of it, and we walk in, and you would have thought that demons invaded the earth. And it's terrifying. My kids were scared and all that stuff. But Halloween's, Halloween's also a time where many of us, we think about things that we don't normally think about. We think about spiritual realities that exist, that exist all year round, but we just think about them at Halloween. Spiritual realities and and questions related to the devil and demons and evil spirits and hauntings. We, we, We think about those things at Halloween because it's kind of a dark holiday. And I just want to say for the Christian parents in the room, whose child is having recurring nightmares, or for the Christian in the room that is afraid because of the forces of darkness that are at work in our world, can I just encourage you with Psalm 121, verse 7, this is a promise. And it's a promise that the Lord will keep you from all evil. There is no evil on planet earth that can stand against you because the Lord, and here's what's so cool, the the word for Lord that's used here is the word Yahweh, the same word that's used to describe God, the warrior God that led his people and defeated all of the Egyptian army. The same God that led his people in the promised land and crumbled the walls of Jericho. The same warrior God that took a stone and guided it perfectly to annihilate a giant from a shepherd boy. That same Yahweh God will keep you from all evil. It's important for us to see this, Christians. This is just kind of a minor point. This isn't what the message is about. Maybe we'll we'll talk about this more some other time. But it's important for us to see that we don't believe in a dualistic uh, faith. We don't believe that Satan and his minions are on an even playing field with God. No, we believe that God has utterly defeated the enemy and made him a laughing stock. That doesn't mean he's not coming after us, but hear this, he can't touch you. He can scare you, but he can't touch you. And we have already won this great battle. You can have peace in spiritual warfare because your God is fighting the battle. He's fighting your battles. I want to end today where the psalmist does. In Psalm 121, verse 8, he says, The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. You know, I, I, I opened up asking, What is your help? How do we have peace and chaos? Our help and our peace and chaos is our great and sovereign God who reigns above every circumstance that has happened in human history and every circumstance that will happen in human history. 
he will keep you. He will keep your going out and coming both now and forevermore. So, when natural disaster strikes or thunder roars or floodwaters rise, Christian, your God will keep you. When terrorists plot or dictators make threats, God is sovereignly keeping his people. When, when viruses run rampant or disease infects or cancer metastasizes, hear this, Christian, your God will keep you. When rumors are come, it's found out that rumors are true and relationships are broken and trust is violated. When, when he walks out or when she does the unthinkable, when addiction seems to have a stranglehold over a member of your family's life, when words are spilled and forgiveness is far, God will keep you. And again, on Tuesday, whether a Republican or a Democrat is elected in the White House, you can have peace in your house because your God will keep you, Christian. He will keep you. He'll keep your going out and your coming in from this time and forevermore. So believers in the room, lift up your eyes to the hills. Lift up your eyes to the hills. Don't lower your eyes to what culture says. Don't lower your eyes to what everyone else around you says will save you. Christian, we have to lift our eyes. So would you lift your eyes up, man? Would you lift your eyes to the hills? Would you focus on Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of your faith? And can I just tell you, if you can just do that one thing, man, if you, if you can just lift your eyes above the chaos of right now, the chaos of this world will grow strangely dim as you focus in on the one who is keeping your soul. Father God, we need your help. God, we want to admit today that all too often we freak out about the temporary things of earth. God, far too often we are consumed by the things of this earth. And God, we don't want that. God, we want to be filled by your Holy Spirit. God, we want to stand against whatever faces us, God, in a similar way that Martin Luther stood against what faced him. And God, we want to boldly proclaim proclaim faith in our God. Father, would you help us to do that? God, would you help us to live out Psalm 121? God, would you help us to lift our eyes up to you and to see that our help comes from you, God? And in so doing, Father God, would you give us hope and would you give us a peace that doesn't make sense to the rest of our nation? And we pray that in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Would you stand and sing with us?